We're delighted to have you today uh, for the launch of the 2023 Production Gap Report. Thank you so much for tuning in today, everyone. I'm Lindsay Burton, the Communications Officer at Stockholm Environment Institute's U.S. Center. We are here to announce our latest findings on the global production gap. The production gap quantifies the misalignment between government's planned and produ projected production of coal, oil, and gas, and the global production pathways consistent with limiting warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius, according to the Paris Agreement. This report was produced by Stockholm Environment Institute, or SEI, Climate Analytics, E3G, International Institute for Sustainable Development, and the UN Environment Program. More than 80 researchers from more than 30 countries contributed to this work. Joining us today are the co-leads of the 2023 Production Gap Report, Dr. Ploy Ajakolvisat, SCI Research Fellow based in Bangkok, and Michael Lazarus, U.S. Center Director at SCI based in Seattle in the U.S. I'm also delighted to introduce you to Nicholas Hagelberg, UN Environment Program's Senior Program Coordinator of Climate Change located in Nairobi. He will provide some introductory remarks momentarily. After Ploy and Michael share our findings, Andrea Guerrero Garcia, Director of Field Innovation at Growald Climate Fund and member of the Production Gap Report Steering Committee will provide some insights and context for us to reflect on. We're also honored to be joined by some additional report partners today. Uh, those would be Dr. Neil Grant, Climate and Energy Analyst at Climate Analytics, Katrina Peterson, Senior Policy Advisor at E3G, and Dr. Angela Petriello, Senior Researcher at IASD. We will hear more from them after we present our findings. Before I turn it over to Nicholas, I'd like to remind everyone of some guidelines. After we hear from Andrea and report partners, we are happy to take your questions and I'll help facilitate that. If you'd like to ask a question, use the Q&A function and I will do my best to call on you in order and get to as many different people as possible. With that, let's continue. Nicholas Hagelberg has played an instrumental role in the Production Gap Report from its start in 2019, serving on the steering committee and providing detailed review and consultation. He will start us off today with some comments. Nicholas, thank you for all your guidance and I'll turn it over to you now. Uh, thank you, Lindsay. Uh, just when I unmuted myself, we lost power in Nairobi. So I hope that you can see me uh, and hear me. Uh, Lindsay, can you just uh, confirm that you can hear and see me? Excellent. Thank you so much. So welcome also from UNEP's side to the launch event of, of this 2023 Production Gap Report. The PGR is a complementary analysis to UNEP's Emission Gap Report, and we are very pleased to be part of this collaborative report with SCI, Climate Analytics, E3G, and IA, IISD. In only three weeks, uh, the 28th Conference of Parties meeting will take place in Dubai. Negotiating parties will finalize the global stock take and discuss how, among other things, they can enhance uh, mitigation ambition and implementation to keep the Paris Agreement temperature goals alive. The year 2023 is on track to becoming the warmest year on record, and we are at the stage where absolutely all actions are needed to curb emissions. As fossil fuels account for some 90% of carbon dioxide emissions and 35% of human-induced uh, methane emissions, a global transition away from fossil fuel is paramount to avoiding uh, losing the Paris Agreement and to avoiding dangerous climate extremes. As the UN Secretary General has said, in connection with the launch of this report, COP28 must send a clear signal that the fossil fuel age is out of gas, that its end is inevitable. We need credible commitments to ramp up renewables, phase out fossil fuels, and boost energy efficiency while ensuring a just equitable transition." End quote. With those few words, I would like now to turn over to Ploy and Michael to present the findings of the 2023 PGR. Over to you, Ploy. Actually, um, so we're going to move over to Ploy. Michael. So thank you, Nicholas. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is, this year's report is the fourth production gap report. Um, we first launched in 2019, and this year's report features a comprehensive update of the global uh, production gap analysis. 
we'll be reflecting, uh, we are reflecting uh, updated government plans and projections since August uh, 2021, as well as new pathways informed by the latest IPCC 6 assessment report. In this report as well, we explore for the first time the equity implications of government plans. So that's an interesting element. You'll hear more about that from Ploy in just a moment. We do a deeper dive uh, on global fossil fuel reduction pathways uh, consistent with limiting warming to 1.5 degrees. Uh, this year, we consider in particular the uncertainties related to carbon capture and storage and carbon dioxide removal. And in taking those into account, we derive some recommended long-term reduction target for coal, oil, and gas. And you'll hear more about that again from Ploy in just a second. Um, and then also a key feature of the report are uh, 20 uh, expanded country profiles, larger than we did last year to cover more information with more countries um, covered than we did in our last report. And those Profiles uh, in chapter three provide you with an overview of the climate ambitions and as well as the plans, policies, and strategies that countries have to both continue to support fossil fuel production or, in some cases, um, it's nice to see uh, development now in terms of transitioning away from it in a managed and equitable way. So, with that, I turn it over to Ploy to dive more deeply into this year's production gap assessment. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, next slide, please. And thank you uh, again to all our panelists for joining us today and to you and the audience for joining us online for our launch event. Before I dive into the report findings, I'd like to quickly acknowledge all of our report authors, steering committee and reviewers who are not shown on this slide and other supporters um, listed in our acknowledge acknowledgements page. It truly takes a village to produce um, each year's production gap report, and we're extremely grateful for everyone who has contributed to this work. Next slide, please. All right, so to quantify the global production gap, we first identify the global pathways of fossil fuel production that would be consistent with limiting global warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius, as shown here by the purple and green lines in this figure, along with their respective interquartile ranges. These pathways represent total coal, oil, and gas production intended for all energy and non-energy uses and are informed by selected mitigation scenarios compiled in the IPCC assessment report. In a nutshell, these model-generated scenarios chart out cost-optimized pathways for limiting warming to a given temperature threshold by relying on different combinations and extents of major mitigation strategies to transform our energy and land use systems to achieve net zero carbon dioxide emissions. Next, we estimate the so-called government plans and projections or GPP pathway shown here by the red line. This represents our estimate of the global levels of fossil fuel production implied by government's plans and projections based on our review of recent and publicly available national energy outlooks and strategies of 19 major fossil fuel producing countries as of August, 2023. These 19 countries um, uh, account altogether for around 80% of global fossil fuel production. Um, we profile 20 countries individually um, in chapter three, but unfortunately outlooks from South Africa were not available. And their aggregated projections are then scaled up to derive a global pathway based on these countries' estimated shares of future global fossil fuel production as modeled by the International Energy Agency or the IEA under a scenario consistent with countries fulfilling their existing policies. So the production gap is the discrepancy between the global levels of fossil fuel production under the government plans and projections pathways and those under the 1.5 or two degree C consistent pathways in any given year. In this year's report, we also show the global production pathways implied by countries' stated climate policies and by countries' announced climate pledges as of September 2022, as modeled by the IEA, shown in this figure by the solid and dashed gold lines. And finally, I just want to note that fossil fuel production can be represented in several different units. Quantifying the production gap 
um, in terms of energy base units allow for the most direct comparison uh, to the model outputs of the IPCC assessed scenarios, but we can also aggregate across coal, oil, and gas to represent production in terms of the amount of greenhouse gas emissions expected to be released from the production and combustion of extracted fuels, as we do in our main headline figure here for comparability with other climate assessments like the forthcoming, forthcoming unit emissions gap report um, due for release on the 20th of November later this month. Next slide, please. So in this year's analysis, we find that in aggregate, governments are still planning to produce in 2030 around 110% more fossil fuels than would be consistent with limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius and 69% more than would be consistent with limiting warming to two degrees Celsius. And as you can see in this figure, the production gap with respect to both temperature limits grow wider out to 2050. And we find that the size of the overall production gap in particular in 2030 relative to 1.5 degrees C has remained largely unchanged compared to our prior assessment since we first started tracking this metric in 2019. And so despite encouraging signs of an emerging clean energy transition, the persistence of the global production gap puts a well-managed and equitable energy transition at risk and also conflicts with government's climate commitments. Next slide, please. The production gap can also be shown in terms of its component fuels, plotted here in energy and physical base units. As you can see from the purple pathways in these figures, global production of coal, oil, and gas all declined substantially and rapidly between now and 2050 in order to limit long-term warming to 1.5 degrees C with no or limited temperature overshoot. However, as shown by the red pathways, government plans and projections when taken together would lead to an increase in global coal production until 2030 and in global oil and gas production until at least 2050, which is the end year of our analysis. In 2030, government's production plans and projections would lead to around 460% more coal, 29% more oil, and 82% more gas than would be consistent with limiting warming to 1.5 degrees C. As you can also see in these figures, the disconnect between planned fossil fuel production and levels implied by government's climate policies and pledges are also apparent across all three fossil fuels. Given that government's production plans and targets help to influence, legitimize, and justify continued fossil fuel dependence, there is a real risk that such plans are undermining the energy transition by locking in long-lived fossil fuel infrastructure at the same time, many of these investments in infrastructure are at risk of becoming stranded assets as the world decarbonizes and fossil fuel production targets fail to reflect falling demand and changing socio-political realities. Next slide, please. The size and nature of the global production gap also raises the question of how it can be closed in a managed and equitable way. Now it's beyond the scope of this year's report to provide differentiated 1.5 degree C aligned pathways for different countries. Um, but as we explored back in our 2020 production gap report and informed by the growing literature on this topic, an equitable transition away from fossil fuels should recognize that country circumstances differ widely depending on their financial and institutional capacity, as well as their level of socioeconomic dependence on fossil fuel production. While simplified, these two indicators nonetheless capture the broad challenge that an equitable global transition will entail. So in this figure, taking income level per the World Bank classification as a broad proxy for transition capacity, we find that if we aggregated the plans and projections of 19 countries underlying the global GPP pathways, the levels of planned coal, oil, and gas production by 10 high income countries alone would already exceed global levels under the 1.5 degree C consistent pathways by 2040. If we repeat this exercise by grouping countries by their levels of relative economic dependence on fossil fuel production, we also find that the plans and projections of 12 countries with relatively lower dependence would exceed the 1.5 degree C pathways by 2040 for each fuel. And so without proactive engagement and discussion between parties, there is a real risk that global, a global fossil fuel phase out will be highly inequitable, fail to support vulnerable communities and further erode trust in global cooperation on climate action. Next slide, please. 
In sections 2.3 and 2.4 of chapter two this year, um, we analyzed the selected 1.5 degree C consistent pathways from the IPCC AR6 database, along with the IEA's 2023 update of its net zero emissions by 2050 scenario, or the NZE, to explore the global reduction pathways of coal, oil, and gas production that would be consistent with achieving net zero CO2 emissions by mid-century in more detail. Um, I want to highlight here three key insights and policy implications from these analyses. Firstly, to keep the 1.5 degree C goal in reach, the global production and consumption of all three fossil fuels needs to decline substantially between now and 2050, alongside other key climate mitigation strategies like scaling up renewable energy, improving energy efficiency, and reducing methane emissions from all sources. This is also true regardless of whether a given scenario relies on the future large-scale deployment of fossil CCS and or carbon dioxide removal or CDR later on or not. Secondly, the modeled reductions in coal, oil, and gas depend on and influence one another, especially in the nearer term. And so it's important to focus and set reduction targets for all three fossil fuels, not just on coal. And lastly, the pace and magnitude of the modeled reductions um, in coal, oil, and gas are particularly sensitive to the assumed reliance on carbon capture and storage and CDR, especially for gas. And from our analysis, we find that taking a precautionary approach um, to limiting reliance on these uncertain technologies means that at a minimum, countries should be aiming for a near total phase out of coal production and use by 2040 and a combined reduction in oil and gas production and use by around three quarters by 2050 from 2020 levels. Next slide, please. And while these long-term global reduction targets are informed by the cost-optimized mitigation scenarios we analyze, it's important to bear in mind that other factors and lines of evidence should also be considered, which reinforce the need for an even faster phase out of fossil fuels. So firstly, even though we apply some scenario filtering criteria to screen out mitigation scenarios with excessive fossil CCS and CDR reliance, the majority of AR6 assess scenarios do still assume the successful large-scale commercialization of these measures. However, the annual capacity from operating CCS projects resulting in dedicated storage currently sum up to less than 0.1% of global annual CO2 emissions. Second, the mitigation scenarios we, we analyze explore how society can achieve net zero CO2 emissions in the most cost-effective way, but without accounting for the localized near-term and non-climatic harms of coal, oil, and gas extraction and burning, such as toxic air, water, and waste pollution. And so one could almost argue, I would say, that the fact that fossil fuel-driven air pollution are causing millions of people around the world to fall ill and die prematurely every year should be enough reason to accelerate a fossil fuel phase out in every country. And finally, other research has shown that the committed CO2 emissions from existing fossil fuel production and consumption infrastructure already exceed the remaining emissions budget consistent with limiting warming to 1.5 degrees C. Indeed, the IEA NZE scenario foresees no need for new coal mines or new oil and gas fields after 2021 amid declining global fossil fuel demand. And so altogether, there is overwhelming scientific evidence that we need to phase out all fossil fuels as rapidly as, rapidly as possible. And with that, I turn over to my co-lead, Michael Lazarus. Thanks so much, Ploy. Um, so as part of the basis for the production gap analysis that Ploy was just referring to, we compile uh, extended country profiles um, for about 20 countries this year, for 20 countries this year. Those 20 countries represent 82% of global fossil fuel production. And not only that, they also account for around three quarters of global fossil fuel consumption, as well as territorial emissions. So when we cover these countries, we are covering much of both production and use. Um, these country profiles wouldn't be possible without the participation in the report of a number of country experts. So we rely heavily on those. Um, Floyd gave a nod to them earlier. I saw several of them listed amongst the participants here. Um, 
that's how we we bring these together through extensive research as well as uh, relying on publicly available government information as well as the opportunity for governments to review and respond as well. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we focus on governments. I saw a question in the Q and A. You know, do we look at what investor-owned companies do? We focus on on governments and government policies and actions and perspectives in this report because governments play a central role in setting the direction for future fossil fuel production. State-owned enterprises control half or more of global oil, gas, and coal production. And government plans, projections, policies, and incentives also guide private sector decisions. For example, governments around the world continue to provide subsidies to the producers of fossil fuels. In 2021, producer subsidies hit their highest level, $78 billion, since the OECD began tracking them. There is a bit of good news as well, that international public finance for fossil fuel production is declined for fossil fuels generally is on the decline, uh, down 35% uh, from 2016 to 2018 levels. Many countries have signed the Glasgow Statement to end international public finance for unab unabated fossil fuel projects and to re redirect investments to clean energy. But international public finance for fossil fuels is still twice the level as it is for clean energy. Next slide. So we look, as mentioned, at the climate ambitions of countries, as well as their plans and policies for fossil fuel production. 17 of the countries that we profile here have pledged to achieve net zero emissions. At the same time, most continue to support, invest, and plan on the expansion of fossil fuel production. Many of these countries have launched initiatives to reduce the emissions from fossil fuel production activities, upstream emissions. Uh, initiatives such as the Net Zero Producers Forum and the Global Methane Pledge. But none of these initiatives mentions the need to reduce fossil fuel production itself. And none of these countries have committed to reducing coal, oil, and gas production in line with limiting warming to 1.5 degrees. Indeed, most countries with significant proven oil and gas reserves plan to increase production as this table, table ES1 in the report shows. Uh, only four of 17 oil producers surveyed anticipate a decline out to 2030. And those decreases are small and due largely to natural decline. Many countries are still promoting gas as an essential bridge or transition fuel, but with no apparent plans to transition away from it later to get off the bridge. Uh, and all need major producers are planning increases. Several countries even plan major increases in coal production out to 2030. Now, why? Uh, you may ask. Uh, and as some have pointed out, how does this this clashes with some projections that fossil fuels will peak soon. Uh, governments have many rationales, however, for aiming to increase production, uh, reducing import dependency, generating government revenue, legal obligations, confidence in winning out as one of the last producers in a dwindling market. Some even argue that their oil and gas would lower global emissions because they produce them more cleanly. Problem is that when taken together, that's what leads to the production gap itself. Next slide. There are, however, some encouraging signs of change as we spoke, as, as noted, and others have pointed out uh, and analyzed on international public finance. We're seeing positive signs of change. Uh, we're seeing lots of ambitious policies to accelerate the transition and reduce the demand for fossil fuels, policies in a number of leading countries, leadership uh, on renewables in China and India, um, 
the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, EU Fit for 25, the list goes on across countries. Um, we're also seeing for the first time that countries have begun to develop scenarios for domestic fossil fuel production that are consistent with national or global net zero targets, something we hadn't seen when we first launched the production gap report. We also see support for a just energy transition is growing, although it's still mostly focused on coal-fired power generation. Uh, several countries uh, joined a couple of years back, the Powering Past Coal Alliance, and now there is a new alliance called the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance and that seeks uh, a managed phase out of oil and gas production. And now Colombia has joined as a friend of Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance. So um, there are positive signs out there as well. Next slide. So finally, in closing, what do governments need to do to close this production gap? Well, first, they need to align their fossil fuel plans and projections with the Paris Agreement's temperature goals, as well as their own net zero commitments. Uh, they need to coordinate their strategies. As Ploy pointed out, it's not just not so simple just to focus on energy efficiency or promoting renewables. That has to all be done coordinated with uh, planning for a transition away from the production of fossil fuel as well. Even the IEA pointed out this year that coordinating the wind down of fossil fuel supply with the wind down of fossil fuel demand will be essential. That coordination will be essential to avoid locking in unsustainable levels of fossil fuel infrastructure and investment that could impede the energy transition and create stranded assets and communities. This also will help to avoid damaging price spikes as we've seen or supply guts. So that coordination is important. That's how these plans and projections can become aligned. It's important that countries adopt near and long-term reduction targets and, <clears throat> and, to use and use those to complement, as just pointed out, those other climate mitigation efforts and targets. Um, Ploy pointed out that our analysis suggests that countries should aim for a near total phase out of coal production and use by 2040 and a combined reduction in oil and gas production and use by three quarters by 2050 from 2020 levels. At a minimum, in light of not only CDR and CCS risks and uncertainties, but the damages that fossil fuel production can have through air pollution and other means um, to overburden communities. And with that in mind, finally, I wanna note that it's essential that Countries recognize their differentiated responsibilities and capabilities in this context, and that governments with greater transition capacity should aim for more ambitious reductions than what the global average is that Ploy spoke to and we just saw, and help to finance the transition efforts in countries with limited capacities. So with that, thank you for your attention. I'd like to turn it over to Andrea to give us some discussant insights and reflections on the report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael and Ploy. And uh, it, this is an amazing effort. And not being one of the brilliant scientists and analysts that worked on this, my job here is to provide a couple of insights from a diplomacy and national policy background on, on what are were the messages that really impacted me and to open a bit of a discussion that way. So, for me, there were two big points that I, I took from this report. One was a reflection on how timely the, the report is with the conversation that's happening on the way to COP28 in terms of do we need to talk and have commitments about production, fossil fuel phase out, and that to be a complement to the existing mitigation commitments. And for me, seeing a gap that is this sizable and that it's not getting smaller, it is a yes. We do need to have that discussion in, in, in the international arena. This does need to be uh, part of hopefully language that a country set, us, set for having clear market signs and clear goals for themselves. 
The other part that I found very innovative and, and a new way of looking at things is especially in with regards to oil and gas, because we kind of had some assessment of differentiated timelines for coal, is how countries can tackle this situation depending on the different capacities they have and levels of income they have. So for me, it was very striking to see in this report that there is a very big disconnect between countries that are even considered climate ambitious and their plans. And so there is this um, call for countries to be coherent and to, especially if they have the capacities, align those um, production goals with their ambitious climate goals. It's clear that they have recognized that climate is an important issue for themselves and globally. And now this for me is, is the clear next step. For other developing countries that don't have the capacity to phase out uh, at, at this moment, and being from one of those fossil fuel dependent countries myself, it kind of keeps me up at night, to be honest, because it the challenge in front of us is very, very big. We have to first have the political will, and some of these countries, including my own, now have expressed that political will, but they need the support as well to do this. So just to wrap our heads around how big the task is for these countries, first they have to convince their political system and their people that this these targets for uh, deviating from these production this production plans need to be done. And that's a tall task. That's not easy to understand because obviously there's a concern of what else are we going to live from? <clears throat> Some of the countries have a high, high percentage of their GDP that is dependent on the fossil fuel exports mainly. Uh, then when they have that, they need to set these targets and they need to figure out what is going to fill that economic gap in their country. What are these regions in their country and the country as a whole, what is a best fit for economic progress if it's not fossil fuels? And even this is a great amount of work and consensus building and analysis, which in many cases they need support of. When you have that, then you need to go into a plan like nothing we've seen really in most of our countries in terms of educating people for the right new business uh, uh, lines that we're opening. We need to create capacity in the workers and the businesses from the fossil fuel industry to be able to participate in this new economy. And we need to build up the infrastructure needed for it. And all of this is very costly. And there's currently not enough discussion, in my opinion, in the international community on how we are going to support these countries in their task of economic uh, diversification and growth in uh, alternative business lines that are sustainable and that are not fossil fuel dependent. So yes, for me, it is very impactful to see the risk of stranded assets, uh, how much developing countries and other countries are betting on a market that is very probably not going to be there for their fossil fuel products and how unprepared we are, how, how early it is in the conversation in many countries, um, especially seeing all of these, these next steps that have to be done and have to be done very quickly if you look at the timelines. So I'll stop there, but I, I really want to emphasize the importance of this report coming and, and hope that it does reach policymakers and decision makers uh, in the countries that are listed here and, and others. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andrea, and thank you for all your support on the Production Gap Report. Now I'd like to turn to our report partners for further reaction. Let's start with Neil at Climate Analytics. Neil, your research has examined the various uncertainties related to carbon capture and storage, of course known as CCS, and carbon dioxide removal, CDR. How do we ensure that pathways for phasing out fossil fuels are robust to those uncertainties? How would you like that to be reflected in the COP28 outcomes? Neil? Thanks, Lindsay. And I'd like to start by just saying it's great to be here at the launch of the report. And I'm yeah, grateful to all the co-authors and everyone who's contributed to uh, this report. Um, yes, as, as you said in your question, you know, there's, there's significant uncertainties around the feasibility of upscaling uh, CCS and CDR, but 
I think I'd start by actually saying something which we're very clear on around CCS and CDR, which is that they are not going to be the solutions for cutting emissions in this critical decade. We know that, we've seen the IPCC has shown that, uh, the IEA has shown that. There's a huge range of evidence which uh, is very clear that CCS and CDR will not be able to scale fast enough to make a meaningful contribution to cutting emissions this year, uh, this decade. Um, and that means that in this decade, the solution has to be reducing fossil fuel production and use. Um, but as we go out and look over the, the more long term, then we do see that there is significant uncertainty around the feasibility of building up CCS and CDR. You know, carbon dioxide removal technologies are very nascent. There's lots of exciting work going on to scale options here at the moment, but it's from a very, very low base. And CCS has a very poor track record. Around 80% of the demonstration projects over the last 30 years have ended in failure. And so it's really important that we uh, limit CCS and CDR reliance to avoid unrealistic or unsustainable reliance on these technologies. And that's the approach that we took here in the production gap report. So all, it's, I think, as Ploy was saying, it's important to emphasize that the gap that we calculate and find and all the work we do is based on looking at 1.5 compatible pathways which avoid unsustainable and excessive reliance on CCS and CDR. And the results are really clear. It shows that fossil fuels need to decline now, they need to decline fast, and they need to head rapidly towards zero. So I think the most important point as we think about uncertainty in CCS and CDR is to be clear that they these technologies do not replace the need for rapid and permanent reduction of fossil fuels. Um, and they therefore really can't be used as a justification for continued or expanded fossil fuel extraction, which is a narrative that we're being seen you know, pushed around the world, and particularly as we come towards uh, COP28. Um, and so I think that's that, that's the key thing I'd want to say. I think in our in our scenarios, as Ploy said, there's still some CCS and CDR. You can see this in uh, figure 2.4 in the report. And so we did look at what happens if we actually reduce this further. We take latest latest opinions from experts on what actually might be feasible for these technologies. And that's where we get some of our key long term targets, which is that we need to be uh, effectively phasing out coal from the energy system by 2040. And we, we need to be cutting oil and gas by at least 75 percent in 2050. And again, I'd highlight that we should see these targets as ambition floors, not ceilings. They're the minimum level we need to be getting to. And really, we need to be going beyond them. Um, yeah, so that's, that would be my reflections on that particular part. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you so much, Neil. Let's turn to Katrina, Pe Katrina Peterson at E3G. Uh, the report points to a disconnect between the global turn away from coal use and power and other sectors and countries' plans to increase coal production. As someone who's been working in this area, can you speak to what that disconnect means for efforts to achieve a just, well-managed transition away from coal? Thanks, Lindsay, for that question. Um, and thanks, everyone who's who's on the call, everyone that's joined, everyone who's speaking on the panel. It's, it's really great to be here for the launch of this excellent and very important report. Um, to kind of follow up on something that Andrea touched on just before as well, you know, the, the production gap really uh, report really shows just how strikingly disconnected, you know, the scale of government's planned production of coal, oil and gas is from the reality of the actual shrinking demand for those fossil fuels. Um, and that's especially apparent for coal, um, even without the additional uh, climate policies that we need to see, global demand for coal is going to peak within the next couple years. Um, it's likely going to crash after that simply on the basis of, you know, pure economics alone. Coal simply can't compete as a fuel with cheap renewables. And, you know, countries are recognizing that. Um, the global pipeline of new coal plants is collapsing almost everywhere in the world, except for China, where it will also peak and go start to go down soon. And, you know, countries are expanding their, their clean energy systems instead. And so there really is no future long term for coal, uh, long term future for coal demand. Um, and, you know, as the dirtiest fossil fuel, it's also the one that we absolutely have to, to kind of work to phase out the fastest alongside, of course, a rapid phase out of oil and gas, too. And and that story of, of peak demand is repeating for oil and gas as well. They will peak this decade um, even without further policies in place. There is no long term future for any fossil fuels. Um, but kind of, but countries sort of predict, um, 
plans for, for production are completely uh, disassociated from that reality and, and for coal specifically, it shows just how pressing it is for those coal producing countries to rein in their production plans and, you know, urgently focus on creating managed transitions for, for their people working in the coal sector, for their coal reliant regions, for companies and for assets. If, if countries don't wake up to the fact that expanded plans for coal production are completely out of sync with actual demands and with how much faster we need to go in the shift away from fossil fuels to stay uh, on track for a 1.5 degree pathway. Um, and if countries don't carefully plan for phasing out their production to align with that direction of travel, then all they're really doing is exposing their coal industry workers and the communities that rely on them to huge risks of, of loss of livelihoods and of economic insecurity. And, you know, of course, the just transition away from coal and, and for all fossil fuels isn't just a, a nice to have in terms of managing the risks of the transition. It's an absolute prerequisite for creating the, the political possibility within a country to actually enable the clean energy transition in the first place, you know, without embedding a focus on, on justice for workers uh, into policies and plans for the energy transition. Governments just risk public backlash, they risk political opposition, and an overall failure in their ability to really push forward the climate policies that we need from them. Um, good conversations are happening on thinking about, you know, well-managed just transition away from coal in some countries. Um, the Just Energy Transition Partnerships that I'm sure many of you will have heard of in, in South Africa, Indonesia, Vietnam, and recently Senegal as well, um, are, you know, good steps in the right direction. And I think it's important to say that, you know, their very existence shows that wealthy countries really recognize the principle of equity as another key part of a well-managed transition away from fossil fuels in that, you know, kind of countries in the global south need financial support to help them transition away from economies where they rely substantially on fossil fuel production for, for that economy. Um, and, you know, wealthy countries have a responsibility to provide that uh, financial support and they recognize that through things like the just energy transition partnerships but i would say that it's not yet fully clear whether those partnerships are actually providing the you know sufficient finance at scale that we need to see for them to be transformative in the way that's needed um so overall i just end on saying that you know we're not where we need to be in countries managing their energy transitions well to avoid economic and social risks we're not there on coal we're not there on oil or on gas and so you know, the final thing to say is really that, you know, for COP28, we need countries to start having that conversation. We need them to recognize the reality that the clean energy transition is inevitable. It needs to be faster. Fossil fuel demand is already in decline and that needs to accelerate too. And that, you know, makes a commitment to adjust and manage phase out of all fossil fuel production and use completely necessary uh, unless countries want to take the risks of letting that be an unmanaged transition. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, finally, Angela, IISD. Angela, as the PGR notes, government subsidies to fossil fuel producers in 2021 hit their highest level since records have been kept. What's behind that rise and what should be done about it? Thanks, Lindsay, and thanks everybody for all the great work on, on the report. So, yes, indeed, uh, as Michael already pointed out uh, in the presentation, the latest estimates that we've got on producer subsidies uh, by the OECD are for 2021, and, you know, they show uh, 64 billion US dollar uh, in producer subsidies, which is 17% higher than the 2019 uh, figure and is the highest since the OECD started uh, tracking these numbers. And uh, what these numbers include basically is uh, government support to different stages of fossil fuel production uh, that are made out of two main elements, uh, budgetary transfers and tax uh, breaks. Uh, there is something that is not included in these numbers. And it's, uh, for example, investments in fossil fuel production by fossil fuel uh, state-owned enterprises, SOEs. And we at IISD recently calculated uh, that also for last year. And even on that number, we saw that the investments by SOEs in fossil fuel productions uh, got uh, its highest uh, record number last year over a period of uh, eight years. So... Together, the sum of the producer subsidies as computed by the OECD and the investments by fossil fuel SOEs are at the moment providing mm, a huge down payment to uh, new fossil fuel production. Uh, 
and there is an argument uh, that says that subsidies to production are not that important because they are a lot smaller than subsidies to consumption. And uh, so, yeah, they are a small uh, portion of the overall fossil fuel subsidies. But there are two reasons why that is not really true and their importance shouldn't be underplayed. And one is the problem of transparency, of course. Fossil fuel subsidies are, in general, affected by poor transparency, but this is particularly the case for uh, producer subsidies. So there is good grounds to think that the numbers that we've got there are uh, big underestimates of the real figures. On the other hand, uh, the way governments structure these subsidies is uh, in a way that crowds in uh, private investments into fossil fuel production as well. So you end up with a total investment in production, which is a lot bigger than it would be without those subsidies uh, being there. And yeah, to conclude, what to do about it? So I think there are a couple of issues at the moment. Um, and one is that the timelines for uh, fossil fuel uh, subsidies phase outs are actually too distant. So there is no immediate need for countries to phase out fossil fuels, including uh, production uh, subsidies. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about you know, 2025 for the G7, 2030 under the SDGs. Um, so we need those timelines to be clearer and closer. Uh, for example, we've been looking at 2025 for uh, developed countries before 2030 for all the other countries. The second issue is that uh, what parties signed up to uh, in the commitment text in uh, COP26 was the commitment to phase out for, or inefficient fossil fuels, which of course gives uh, a huge uh, loophole for countries to say that their fossil fuel subsidies are not inefficient and so they don't need to be phased out. So that has to be corrected. Uh, all fossil fuel subsidies need to be phased out, except uh, potentially the few ones that are uh, justifiable, for example, that are essential to improve um, energy access. And in general, the phase out should happen in conjunction with a number of other policies that have already been mentioned in the report and by the other panelists to uh, ensure a just transition for the affected workers and communities, but also to uh, increase the deployment of renewable energies and energy efficiency and electrification that can guarantee energy security. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Many thanks to you, Angela, and to all our report partners. Now we'll take your questions. Again, please navigate to Zoom's Q&A function and add yourself to the queue. We've already received uh, uh, many uh, insightful questions, and some of our experts are even typing those as we go. So do keep your eye on that. Um, I will pitch your question to our panel of experts and attempt to cover as many different questions from as many different people as possible. Thank you. And also we've received a question on where to find the report online. Uh, go to productiongap.org and you should see all the materials there. Um, so let us turn to the Q&A. Um, Glenn writes, we're in a heap of trouble. How can we drive accountability and accelerate the transition to reduce impacts and replace fossil energy? Katrina, did you want to take that one? Yeah, I can I can take that one. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I mean, you know, I think that's the that's the million dollar question. Um, and the thing we all want to see happen. Um, and you know, certainly I agree that we're not where we want to be, but uh there are ways to get there. Um, and you're right to talk about accountability because that is absolutely one of the key things. Um, what I would say firstly is that, you know. We have a very key moment coming up, which is COP28, and that is an opportunity for governments to really escalate the level of ambition uh, that they're willing to come up with to, you know, match the urgency of, of the situation that we're in. Um, and it requires them to, to be much bolder and, and much more uh, firm in their commitments and also much more transparent in terms of how they are declaring the policies that will get them to the targets they themselves have set. And that includes being much more transparent about their policies and plans for fossil fuel production. Um, 
what I would, what we can, what I'm hoping that we can see at this COP and what I think will at least be one part of, of getting us in the right direction of, of you know, reducing uh, use of fossil fuels is for countries to really step up and agree that face out, uh, that full face out of fossil fuels um, by the middle of the century that we have all been talking about. Um, alongside that, they need to be committing to tripling capacity for renewables, they need to be doubling energy efficiency, and crucially, they need to be talking about how to ensure that the finance to support all countries in being able to make that transition is there. Um, to stepping up on these kind of commitments can actually help countries, you know, take control of the energy transition rather than just letting it happen to them. Um, and through that kind of focus, you know, stimulate the, the investment um, and the, the development of ambitious policies that could be effective as well that, that we need to see. Um, and we really need that ambitious outcome that will, you know, tilt policy and investment towards renewables away from fossil fuels um, and kind of and shift the whole landscape. Crucially for that will be accountability and the UNF, uh, the UN process um, needs to be looking more into how to hold countries accountable on the commitments that they make. And countries themselves also need to be much more upfront and transparent with, you know, sharing the plans uh, for how they will actually meet the targets that they themselves have set. Um, many countries are good at saying that they um, want to deliver on net zero um, emissions and many are, are putting some policies in place. But they need to be firmer there. And certainly what we absolutely need to see is, is commitments to stop building new coal plants, to phase out fossil fuels um, and to scale up renewable energy. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for your question as well. Um, our next question, I believe uh, we'll pitch to Ploy. If we follow current production pathways, what temperature trajectory would we be on? Thank you for the great question. Um, so we don't do climate modeling ourselves to estimate um, the resulting global warming outcome under the GPP pathway. But if we were to compare um, the, the pathways to the IEA stated policy scenarios shown in the solid gold line in um, our figure ES.1 or 2.1, the IEA estimates that under its step scenarios, emissions from all greenhouse gas sources would lead to long-term warming of around 2.5 degrees Celsius. And so because our pathway um, of fossil fuel production is higher than that, so assuming all other greenhouse gas emissions um, are equivalent, then it would likely lead to a longer term, um, a, a higher temperature outcome than 2.5 degrees C. And this is um, buried in footnote 11 of chapter two for your reference. Thank you. Thank you, Ploy, and thank you for the question. Uh, next one, I believe, is for Nicholas. How do you think an ambitious global plastics treaty that is still being negotiated could help reduce this gap? Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, I think that was the question from Jan. Um, so, Yes, indeed. So, so plastic do account for some uh, three to four uh, percent of of global greenhouse gas emissions, or they're about uh, two gigaton of of emissions, and and this is projected to be increasing. So, if the plastics treaty is able to to help deliver with a more efficient, uh, sustainable, uh, the the reduce, reuse, recycle. Uh, issues around plastics, then yes, uh, there is will be a positive uh, impact of the, the plastic treaties on, on emissions as well from the fossil fuel uh, sector. So, so I, I do believe that. I don't quite have the numbers what the projections may, may be, but at least the, the current emissions and, and the projection of that doubling by 2050, 2060, uh, with uh, with current trajectories uh, gives you an indication on that uh, that there are 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 wins to be had also if we're smarter and and more sustainable with uh, with plastic production and use and and uh, perhaps just one additional element that uh, the the emissions coming from plastic production tend to ninety percent be in the production chain uh, so in 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 uh, that that's really where there is opportunities for for uh, reducing emissions. Back to you, Lindsay. Thank you, Nicholas, and thank you, Jan. Uh, next, we have a question from Will. Just five rich global North countries are responsible for the majority, 51% of planned new oil and gas extraction to 2050. The US, Canada, Australia, Norway, and the UK. Do these countries have the responsibility to move first to phase out fossil fuel production? 
I know that's something we address in the report, who can take that? All right, sure. Since everybody else has had a chance to chime in so far, um, feel free to take this one too, Angela. I think um, that that's one of those softball questions uh, where, um, yes, we argue very strongly in the report. What Ploy's analysis that she presented shows is that, you know, 10 large producing countries can use up basically the carbon budget we have to get to 1.5 with their production alone. Um, this is very much like the collective action problem we face on the emission side. We need to face it on the production side as well. Um, there are a lot of factors that go into who might produce in the 1.5 degree future. Of course, you know, do low cost cleaner producers um, uh, go first? Um, are there ways to um, enable that low cost uh, and lower emitting, upstream emitting production to happen, but yet not disadvantage countries that, um, you know, have not um, garnered the benefits of fossil fuel production and the revenues it's created. So this requires the kinds of negotiations that we've seen happen on other issues uh, related to um, the climate agenda, all the way to loss and damage. And so what we are saying in this report, uh, as others have been saying in this call, is that in the venue like COP28, we need to address this issue head on. It needs to be part of the discussion about all of the equity and other elements of getting to net zero effectively and justly. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Um, we have a couple of questions from Steve Pye, and uh, he is a co-author, so we might actually let him ask and maybe answer some of his questions. Um, but Steve uh, asks, uh, what are the four countries that have net zero aligned production scenarios? And he also asks, can you comment on the equity issues relating to the proposed near total phase out of coal in 2040? Um, raising this to the narrow spread of pathways produced by the scenarios for coal and issues of political feasibility. Um, Steve, I'm allowing you to talk and chime in if you like. Uh, otherwise, Ploy and Michael, would you like to jump in on that? I don't want to put you on the spot, Steve. Sorry, that was my idea. Let me know if that's OK. But since you're a chapter two and chapter three co-author and wrote the relevant paper, on um, coal phase out and equity, I wanted to invite you to share your thoughts, but I can I can answer your first question, which is that um, in this year's report, we found that Indonesia, Germany, China, and Canada have started to develop um, fossil fuel production scenarios that are in line with their national or international um, net zero strategies or um, long-term strategies to decarbonize. Um, but as we kind of discuss in the report, they're largely confined to um, a scenario exercise at this stage, but nonetheless, um, they signal some sort of positive change, positive development. We wanted to highlight that other countries could follow um, because it's it's this very um, reason and oversight of not aligning planned um, domestic fossil fuel production with national and international climate goals that leads to the persistence of the global production gap. And how do you feel about answering your own second question? I can take it if, if you don't want to. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it was just, um, obviously the, the, the reduction trajectory for coal is quite stark and it's, there isn't much variability across the sort of pathways um, that, that, that are used in the production gap report. And I just wondered if, anyone had any reflections on the kind of um, equity issues around that and the implications to some of those sort of big um, coal producers and, and also questions of political feasibility? Because I suppose 2040 isn't that far off. So it was just really putting that out there that it's, um, it's, a, it's a challenging one. Yeah, you raise a really great point, and I think it's it's one of the reasons we focused more on longer term reduction targets, um, as informed by the mitigation scenarios in this year's report too, because the near term reductions are really sensitive to relative differences between coal, oil, and gas. Um, actually, if 
if we look at um, the IEA and ZE in addition to the IPCC assess scenarios, um, the IEA goes slower on coal, but then faster on oil and gas in the near term. Um, and as your paper um, kind of captured, phasing out coal at unprecedented rates that have not been achieved historically um, would, play, uh, would place a large burden on um, emerging economies, lower income economies, because a lot of the major oil and gas producers are sort of upper middle and higher income countries. And so, yeah, it's just this added dimension to this really difficult problem of how do we share the remaining fossil fuel extraction budget in line with limiting warming to 1.5 in an equitable way. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for letting us put you on the spot, Steve. Uh, next, we have a question from Stefan. Are there sufficient alternative energy sources to sustain global energy usage levels, or will the transition away from fossil fuels require reductions in demand? Who can take that one? I can jump in on this to start. Um, yeah, thanks for your question, Stefan. Um, I would say when we look at the current deployment rates of uh, zero carbon technologies like wind and solar, um, we are seeing a really rapid acceleration in their deployment. And we know that the potential for these technologies is vast as well. There's a huge amount of energy which can be provided by these technologies. So I think the picture is very is very positive there and um, that these uh, renewable technologies could replace all demand for fossil fuels and still meet our energy demand requirements. But I would say that um, while that is possible, actually, you know, there is a lot of waste in our energy system. Um, and the more that we can cut that down, the better, you know, uh, moving from a petrol car to an electric car will cut your energy demand for driving per mile by about uh, 80%. Um, and so there's a lot of waste which can be cut out, which will reduce the size of the energy system. And that's a really good thing because um, that will just make us more efficient and uh, allow us to sort of scale our actions faster. Um, and we also know that action on the demand side has a lot of benefits as well. So uh, there's a recent literature review which looked at uh, actions to cut energy demand and show that they have huge co-benefits, so huge benefits to our health and our well-being um, and, and wider benefits to society. So I'd say that um, there's a very positive picture on the uh, ability of zero carbon technologies to, to meet that energy demand. Oh, I'm not sure if I jumped slightly, but um, uh, yeah, there's, there's there's huge potential for them. Um, but absolutely, we shouldn't forget the large benefits of energy efficiency and demand reduction, which can help us just phase out fossil fuels even faster and also bring huge co-benefits to the transition. Lindsay, may I jump in and, and complement a little bit to Neil's uh, point? So, so indeed, uh, there's a lot of positive signs, but I think it's also important that we look at, at how energy is used. So the power side, the tide is, is turning. Uh, there's really good signs. But then when we come over to, to transport, there's uh, some countries like China, for example, where, where that transport-related energy uh, IEA, for example, believes that that will be critical for shifting shifting the, the demand. Uh, Europe, uh, early signs as well, and, and Norway, obviously, is a uh, good example of, of where there may be a, a almost uh, dominant uh, new transport system coming up. But then there are really difficult uh, areas, so, so industrial production, uh, cement, uh, steel, these type of things, where there still it's the economy that uh, that determines if there is an upswing or down downturn in, in the fossil fuel uh, consumption. So we are in the early stages, uh, early part of, of uh, perhaps S curves in terms of many of those sectors. So cement, uh, uh, steel, aluminium, uh, obviously then uh, then uh, airplanes and so on. Uh, so th there there is not a, an immediate uh, turn coming our way. So, so a lot to be done still. Back to you. Thank you. Uh, Nicholas, we're gonna keep it on you for a second. Um, Rachel and Matthew have some related questions. Uh, Rachel asks, is there any way legally or otherwise to get the main producers to cut back significantly on fossil fuel production? We who live in the small island and developing states 
are the most impacted. At COP26 and 27, nothing related to this came into effect. Too much talk and not enough action to help us. Matthew asks, do you think there could be a legal framework for holding governments accountable for the production gap? I know for the EU, there might be one. Nicholas? Thanks. Yes, yeah, so, so a little bit of, of the same answer for both. So uh, just in end of July, uh, UNEP came out, I think it was the third uh, status report on, on climate related litigation. And I'll, I'll copy paste it into our chat box. Uh, but uh, the findings there is litigation is growing exponentially. We are from 2017, we saw like a little bit more than 800 cases. And in the report now to the end of 2022, uh, we're way over 2000 cases as well. And uh, the geographical spread for litigation cases uh, in terms of climate change uh, is, is growing rapidly as well. Out of the... the uh, uh, litigation uh, cases that that the team looked at. There's clearly six categories. So one is the human rights uh, side and and uh, the international law on that. The second one is domestic non-enforcement of climate-related laws and policies. The third one is uh, seeking uh, more or less litigation against uh, fossil fuel companies and, and uh, trying to keep fossil fuels in the ground. The fourth one is around climate disclosure uh, and greenwashing issues, and then the corporate liability and responsibility for harm. And the final one on uh, failures, failures to adapt to the impacts of climate change. In terms of the fossil fuel one, uh, I would say the, the kind of mo well, most known cases is uh, when the Dutch court uh, ordered uh, Shell to comply with uh, with their targets and the Paris Agreement. So that, that's still the, the, the case there. But uh, please have a look at, at the report and, and familiarize yourself. Why I can't give you any like legal advice here is that there's many factors. So obviously it's the... the the jurisdiction, the legal code, the, the every single case is a case on its own. And that, that's perhaps with uh, Matthew's uh, question that could there be a legal framework holding governments accountable? I think there is opportunities already with existing uh, legal frameworks and those legal frameworks are also catching up with climate ambition. Uh, but I do think there is a quite a long way still for for uh, something international that could provide legal opportunities there. Thanks. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, next, we have a question from Isadora. Uh, thank you for the reflection on how decreasing demand is a key message to leverage to avoid new fossil fuel production materializing. Should civil society and the climate movement focus more on demand? I can take that one if that's in reference to uh, fossil fuel demands and 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 not sort of demand reduction through energy efficiency measures. Um, so I'll I'll go with that. Um, thanks for your question. Um, I think you know I think we we need to to focus on both. Um, I think um, focusing on demand is is really and the the narrowing demand for for all fossil fuels is really key for kind of forcing a conversation about stranded asset risk. You know the fact that. Uh, demand for coal, oil, and gas is now all set to peak this decade, according to IEA modeling, and then you know that's historically been somewhat conservative. Um, really shows the huge risk for countries in in pursuing new fossil fuel infrastructure and and fossil fuel expansion, not just for the climate damages that that will obviously cause, but also because it is just a huge economic gamble for those countries, and to lock themselves into future kind of fossil fuel infrastructure when demand is narrowing, um, presents huge risks to kind of their own economic security. Um, and that I think is a, is a message that is important to continuously highlight and by focusing on, you know, continuing to reduce the demand for fossil fuels and showcasing the risk of countries then pursuing more production, um, we can we can continue to push that the message that you know the only way for fossil fuel the, the way for fossil fuels is clearly decline uh, and countries need to be getting ready for that or face huge risks. Um, that said, you know thinking about production and, and supply is obviously also important and as as the report here today shows, um, there's a lot of kind of um, 
fossil fuel producers who invested interest involved that you know will um will always want to promote continued production of fossil fuels and kind of grappling with that issue even in the face of of reducing demand is is crucial to get to grips with uh, with the you know the overall face out that we need and and kind of address um the challenges that come with that from all sides um so yeah that would be my 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 quick reflection on your question thank you thank you katrina um, unfortunately, we only have time for a couple more questions. We may not be able to get to everyone, um, but thank you so much for your continued interest. Let's get to a couple more before we let you go today. Um, we have one from Laura. Do you all provide any guidance for the methods that a country could use to set their extraction-based emission reduction targets? Um, Floyd, feel free to jump in. I know you've had a long day. Floyd is based in Bangkok and it's getting to be past 11 in the evening for her. Um, so uh, the guidance that we provide is pretty much the one that you've seen at the end uh, of the presentation and the report, which is that uh, clearly the countries that have greater capacity and least dependence on revenues and jobs from fossil fuel production should go fastest, uh, and those with the greatest uh, resources or accumulated benefits from fossil fuel production should be helping those out, uh, those countries out who face the greatest transition challenges. There is a literature out there, a small literature, but growing, that goes into a bit more detail about how you characterize transition capacity and dependence, and you can find references to that in our report. And we also had a whole chapter devoted to this question in the 2020 production gap report. So I refer you back to chapter four there. Thanks. Thank you. And let's get to one more question. Uh, in the US, power companies are planning to build more than 100 new natural gas plants. What risks do this pose from a climate perspective and a stranded asset perspective? Maybe I should, you know, being based here in the U.S. and and having worked um, on um, state and local level policy here, I, you know, this is very much an issue right now. Um, and I think the question sort of speaks to its own answer, which is that, um, you know, each case needs to be evaluated specifically, but as the production gap shows and the net zero emission scenario for from the International Energy Agency shows, there is uh, little or no room to build out additional new uh, fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, so um, it does pose a serious risk. It poses a risk of slowing the transition to renewable energy. Um, you know, the benefits of switching from coal to gas and to the extent that they can materialize have already been realized in places like the US. So at this point, um, you know, building out gas-based capacity, which with all of the incentives that then exist to utilize that capacity, as Katrine was pointing to, the sort of vested interests that are associated with that, really important to reckon with. It's not just purely the sort of uh, utility cost benefit analysis that might be done for a given plant. You really have to think about what it means to lock in uh, infrastructure at this point in time. So yes, great risks and um, thanks for the question. Okay, sorry, if you'll forgive me, we have one more that uh, one of us wants to respond to um, and then we'll wrap up. Um, Glenn asks, um, so for, it, he says, it strikes me that no country is going to compromise national security. So diplomacy and accountability on climate, is it possible without superior decarbonized military capability? I wish we could just have peace, but it seems that nationalism and security seem to justify governments to keep the fossil fuel energy, the fossil energy extraction growing. Thoughts on that? Floyd? Thank you. I just wanted to quickly comment that the question is definitely kind of beyond my pay grade, but I wanted to comment that um, we are seeing a lot of governments use the need for energy security narrative to justify continued fossil fuel dependence. But as we elaborate on in the production gap report, 
It's energy that is essential to the fabric of our society, not fossil fuels. And the science now demands that we phase out all fossil fuels as rapidly as possible. Um, and we also know that solar PV and wind are now the cheapest forms of new electricity in most countries of the world today. Um, there are so many climate actions and options out there that governments can be um, focusing on and shifting away from entrenching fossil fuel dependence. And so I, I just wanted to reiterate again, just how urgent it is that we need um, governments to commit to phase out all fossil fuels at COP28 and beyond. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you so much, Ploy. Uh, everyone, thank you for all your interest and questions. Um, we're sorry we couldn't get to everyone, but um, we encourage the conversation to keep happening uh, far and wide. Uh, everyone, thank you so much for spending your time with us and for learning about this work, and we are so proud to share it with you. I'd also like to thank Nicholas, Ploy, Michael, Andrea, Neil, Katrina, and Angela for sharing findings, answering questions, and providing some illuminating insight. Thank you also to Ulrika Lambert, Senior Press Officer at SCI for supporting our presentation today. And on behalf of the Production Gap team, thank you again for your interest and your questions. Have a wonderful rest of your day.